Hello and welcome back to part 11 of this video series on why the pre-tribulational rapture is a false doctrine. In this video, I will be discussing the commonly made argument, really it's just an emotionally manipulative argument, that is often thrown out there by pre-tribbers. Again, it's a very common question. They say, why would God beat up and abuse his bride right before the wedding ceremony? In other words, why would God and Christ allow the saints to be tortured and killed in the Great Tribulation period? Pre-tribulationists don't like the Bible verses in Revelation where the Antichrist overcomes and kills the saints. So they try to come up with this emotionally manipulative argument. So we're going to talk about that in today's video. So the idea is that we as the body of Christ are the bride of Christ, and if the Lord allows us to suffer tribulation, that is the equivalent of him beating us up and abusing us right before the wedding. This is actually a horrible argument, but it's a very, very commonly made argument. And this is probably one of the more shallow cliches that's thrown out there by pre-tribbers. Here are a few statements made by various pre-trib teachers trying to use this argument. So the first one here is by Dr. Tommy Ice. He is the president and the founder of the Pre-Tribulational Research Center. Dr. Tommy Ice says, and I quote, Right before the second coming, according to Revelation 19, the church will be married. So if the church were to go through any part of the tribulation, it would be like Christ beating up his bride, you know, then saying, hey, babe, let's get married, you know, end quote. So well, that's what Dr. Tommy I said there. So the inference here is this. If the Lord allows his church to go through the tribulation, that is the equivalent of him being a wife abuser. He is beating up his bride and he is abusing his wife. I don't know where this sort of cliche began. But I will say that the late Dr. Ed Henson, who was the Professor Emeritus at Liberty, he used it a lot and he used it angrily and vehemently. He would go so far as to put up pictures of a woman all beaten up with a black eye and so forth and say, don't try to tell me this is what God's going to do to his bride and this sort of thing. So he is the one that made this very common. And many pre-tribbers parrot this idea now today. Here's a short statement made by Dr. Henson. You know, Henson says, You don't turn around and beat up the bride of Christ in the tribulation period and then take her to the marriage. I don't think that symbolism works well at all. End quote. So the very idea that the church would ever go through tribulation, that's laughable, again, because it equates to the Lord beating up his bride. Here's another statement made by a pre-trib teacher from Olive Tree Ministries. Her name is Jan Markell. She's a very popular radio host and a very, very adamant defender of the pre-tribulational rapture. Here she's doing a sort of panel Zoom discussion with Amir Sarfati and Barry Stagner, who is uh, also a very well-known pastor in the Calvary Chapel movement. Jan Markell says, and I quote, you know, Ed Henson spoke at my conference in 2013, and he showed a picture of his PowerPoint of a bride totally beaten black and blue. Is Jesus Christ going to do that to his bride? Are you kidding me, she says. Of course, it was very graphic. Her face was totally black and blue from being beaten up. Jesus Christ would never do that to his bride. Never. Because we mean way too much to him. End quote. Okay, again, so there it is. Jesus would never allow his church to face tribulation and great persecution. Because if he did then, that would be the equivalent of him beating up his bride. He cares about us way too much to ever do that. Already you can see the emotionally manipulative nature of this kind of argument. You can see the accusatory nature of this. So if you agree with this line of reasoning then you have to accuse Jesus himself of being a disgusting, violent predator. That's really what it boils down to. Another pre-trib teacher, Mike Goulet, one of the ministers with Behold Israel Ministries, 
Uh, Mike Galay and Amir Safadi together are the two main teachers for Behold Israel. Uh, here Mike Goulet says, and I quote, Why would Jesus allow us, his bride, to be beaten up and bruised, have an eye gouged out, and they're just barely alive, coming to the wedding festival? You know, ripped up dress, gouged out eye, bruises all over the face, end quote. So this is sort of a joke within the pre-tribulational community. You hear this argument all the time in the pre-trib camp. It's thrown out there, it's mocked, it's laughed at. So the first problem, obviously, is this is an appeal to emotion. This is emotional manipulation. It's a deeply emotionally manipulative argument, and it is not an appeal to Scripture. Again, notice in all these kinds of comments, no one quotes any particular scripture verse. They simply frame the notion that the church going through the tribulation equates to Jesus being a spouse abuser, a violent, disgusting person. This is just pure emotional manipulation and zero scriptural support whatsoever. We don't ever want to base our doctrines on just emotional manipulation. If you want to defend the pre-tribulational rapture, defend it from Scripture. Don't try to manipulate people emotionally with these really shallow, kind of pathetic arguments. It's not simply an emotional argument. It's an emotionally manipulative argument. I mean, who in the world likes a person who beats up a woman? Who in the world likes any man that beats up his wife? Most often you've got a stronger individual beating up someone, not just physically, but whenever there's physical abuse, there's also emotional abuse. If there's anyone in the world that we hate, it's a man who beats up his bride. But here, pre-tribbers are actually framing Jesus in that position. It doesn't get any more emotionally manipulative than this. It's not simply an appeal to emotion. It's an appeal to pure emotional manipulation. It's disgusting, and it's like genuinely a disgusting statement for anyone to make. Beyond just the emotionally manipulative nature of it, it's accusatory towards God. It's a blasphemous statement. These pre-trib teachers, Tommy Ice, Dr. Ed Henson, Jan Markle, and Mike Goulet, and others, all of them mocking and laughing at the notion that God and Christ together would let the church go through the great tribulation, and mocking as if Jesus is the most vile, disgusting spouse abuser. And this is accusatory towards the Father, Yahweh, as well. So this whole idea is actually very blasphemous. We all hate spouse abusers, but when you're framing God and Christ in that way, it becomes a sick argument. The bottom line is pre-tribbers are wrong because it is Satan and his evil system that bring us tribulation, not God and his Son, Jesus Christ. God, indeed, will allow the church to go through the great tribulation. Jesus stated such very clearly in Matthew 24, verse 9, where he says, Then they will hate you, and you will be hated. You will be persecuted for my namesake. Jesus is clearly speaking to Christians here. So if we are those who live to see the tribulation, we are the tribulation saints. There will be a multitude of saints alive bearing witness to Jesus during that time of the Great Tribulation. To say, well, Jesus cares so much about us Christians, he would never let that happen to us. But he would allow it to happen to the Jews. He would allow it to happen to Israel, etc. It's a profound, even blasphemous accusation toward God. We must remember that we serve a Messiah who willingly gave all he had for us. He allowed himself to be betrayed by his friends, to be arrested by his countrymen, to be mocked, to be spit on, to be stripped, and to be shamed, to be tortured, to be mutilated, to be torn apart, to be murdered in front of everyone. He subjected himself to God's will, and then he calls us to imitate him. He says, unless you are willing to take up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. You can't be my student. Yet pre-tribbers mock the idea that if he allows us to suffer, to be tortured, to be mutilated like him, then somehow he is unfaithful and he's a bad leader. Today in modern times, we have Muslims regularly saying that our God is some kind of a vampire 
or they often say, what is your God, some type of a child abuser? That he would allow his son to be tortured and mutilated. That's disgusting. I don't serve that God. Of course, Muslims have no problems beheading people for disagreeing with them. And they are antichrist, calling God a vampire, calling God a monster, calling God a cosmic child abuser. They're addressing fundamental realities of the biblical testimony, fundamental realities of the gospel itself. Yes, God sent his only begotten son into the world to be tortured, mutilated, not just murdered, to be tortured. So God did allow his son to be tortured and killed by Satan's system to purchase all mankind. Yes, he allowed that. So is God a cosmic child abuser? Absolutely not. God sent his only begotten son to accomplish what Adam had lost so he could save mankind. Jesus humbly subjected himself to his Father's will to take our place. But again, these types of shallow, emotionally manipulative arguments, they work if someone doesn't really have the ability to think critically. Again, Muslims use them. But why do we allow Christian leaders to use them? It's one thing for someone who is against the gospel and an antichrist, who does not understand the divine wisdom of God in the cross and the shed blood of his son. They don't understand it. That's fine, that's the world, but why are we accepting it when Christian leaders, proclaimers of the gospel, are mocking the wisdom of the cross? They're mocking the idea that we are called to imitate our master. We are called upon to take up our crosses. We are called upon to lay down our lives. The book of Revelation celebrates when the saints love not their lives even to the point of death. It celebrates and honors it, and it sees it as glorifying God. Here's a question we need to ask. Why would it be praiseworthy if the tribulation saints lay down their lives, but something worthy of scorn and mockery if we do? Think about it. We are all called to imitate Jesus. We are all called to lay down our lives if necessary. But pre-tribbers will say, if he allows us to go through the tribulation, he is a child abuser. He would never do that right before the wedding. But what they teach is that the church will be raptured at any moment, and they will go to heaven to enjoy the marriage supper of the Lamb. Yet now, throughout the earth right now, there are Christians being persecuted. Other Christians are being betrayed, and there are Christians being mutilated and martyred and killed, absolutely. In fact, there are more martyrs in the earth, there are more Christians being persecuted in the earth right now than at any time in human history. Pre-tribbers mock the idea if we go through the tribulation that would be us getting beat up, but they still believe that we're being, as the body of Christ, being beaten up right now before the wedding. So I don't even get the cliché. If you just think about it, they are actually saying the exact same thing that they are mocking. But somehow, if it's allowed during the seven-year tribulation, somehow that's different. Atheists, not just Muslims, but God-mockers, commonly one of the main arguments they'll make is they'll say, why does God allow suffering? And they point to all the suffering in the earth as the primary reason why they don't believe in God. Of course, the contradiction is that you can say, well, if you want to say that, you also have to acknowledge the design and the goodness and the beauty that's everywhere in the earth. But of course, they want to focus on the suffering. Atheists love to accuse God by pointing to suffering because they do not understand that Satan is behind all of the suffering in the earth and that God will one day do away with the devil and this evil system. We might expect atheists and Muslims to speak like this due to their ignorance. But why do we allow Christian ministers to make the same emotionally manipulative, blasphemous statements? Why do we allow ministers to do this? It's disgusting and we should reject it. When atheists do it, we should reject it. When Muslims do it, we should reject it. When those who name the name of Christ make such incredibly worldly, carnal, blasphemous comments, we should reject it as well. The fourth problem is that this question is an affront on those Christians who are and who have been martyred throughout history, who have been persecuted, who have been tortured, who have been mistreated throughout history. 
as well as those who are being martyred, persecuted, and hated and rejected today. Again, to be clear right now, at this moment, at the time of this recording, there are more of our brothers and sisters being persecuted throughout the earth. Now, maybe you're not aware of this or even concerned. In the Western countries of the world, we are not in connection with brothers and sisters in Nigeria or in Iran or in Syria or wherever it might be, such as in China. Maybe you're not really in touch with those that are being persecuted, but they are by the thousands. Here is a map from World Watch that shows the countries where Christians are being persecuted today. The countries highlighted in orange are places where Christian persecution is very high, and countries in red are extremely high. The country that is the worst place for Christians to live, rated at number one, as you can see here on the far right of this map, is North Korea. And North Korea, being discovered as a follower of Jesus, is effectively a death sentence. In 2023, the country strengthened its border with China, so it's now harder for Christians to flee and harder for support to reach them. Algeria is number 15 on the map. Algeria has gone up four places on the world watch list with a disturbing increase in persecution. Previously, there were 47 Protestant churches in the country. Now only four remain open, and they are under intense pressure. Nineteenth on the list is China. At least 10,000 churches closed in China in 2023. Most were house churches, but official churches are under pressure too. New regulations mean churches must display signs reading, Love the Communist Party, Love the Country, Love the Religion. Digital surveillance is growing with Christians in one province required to register on a state-controlled app before attending church services. Thirteen Christians a day were killed for their faith in 2023 on average. Nigeria remains the deadliest place to follow Jesus. 82% of killings happened here. Violence only eased during Nigeria's elections, which accounted for a drop in the number of Christians killed globally compared to 2023. The number of attacks on churches and Christian-run schools, hospitals, and cemeteries has exploded in 2023, up sevenfold compared to the previous year. It's been driven by mob violence in India, church closures in China, and attacks in Nigeria, Nicaragua, and Ethiopia. When countries are destabilized by war or extremism, Christians are at risk. In 2023, the number of believers forced to flee their homes more than doubled. Across the most dangerous countries for believers in sub-Saharan Africa, about 3% of all Christians are displaced. In 2023, there were 295,120 Christians displaced from their homes. If you notice on this map, many of the severely persecuted countries are in Muslim-populated areas. Now notice the same map showing the U.S. As you can see, not much persecution goes on in the United States. This won't always be the case, especially when the Antichrist begins his rule during the Great Tribulation. How can we say that if the church goes through the seven-year tribulation, that's unacceptable, but the reality is Christians have always been persecuted, and that doesn't mean that God is somehow unjust or that he is somehow a child abuser or a wife abuser. Of course not. In order for us to accept it, we have to recognize and understand the wisdom of the cross, and this is really what this boils down to. In the Western world, the gospel that is often preached many times is some kind of prosperity gospel, not the gospel about the kingdom that Jesus preached. In the Western world, Christians often, again, not always, but it's often a message of self-betterment. It's a self-therapeutic message. How to make your life better now. How to improve your life, your best life now. How to manifest money and material things in your life. Joel Olstein's church is a good example of this kind of gospel being taught in many churches today. Most churches today are not preaching the kingdom of God as Jesus did. If you haven't seen my video on the prosperity gospel, go and check that out. But the gospel as proclaimed in the pages of scripture says to take up your cross, 
Jesus actually said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. He says, unless you're willing to hate your mother, your father, your children, your spouse, even your own life, you cannot be my disciple. You can't be a Christian unless the amount of love that you have for God far surpasses the love that you have even for your spouse, for your children, or your own existence. He says, unless you're willing to be a martyr and take up your cross, you can't be my disciple. The modern day church needs to understand the issue of integrity to God by proving the devil to be a liar and to understand the wisdom of the cross. The only reason that anyone gets away with making such blasphemous statements and these blasphemous cliches is because so much of the Western world does not understand this issue of proving the devil a liar at all costs and the wisdom of the cross. If they did, they would reject it. When some Christian leader says God would never allow his church to go through the tribulation and that God is a child abuser, We should stand up and say, how dare you accuse God? How dare you refer to Jesus as a wife beater? We're not testifying that God is a child abuser. We're standing up with people like Job, who suffered many terrible things, and yet he remained faithful to God. Let's read the account of how Satan accused Job at Job chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. There it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. In verse 8 here, Satan focuses only on the fear of the Lord. Does Job fear God for no reason? Satan here questions the depth, sincerity, and the resilience of Job's relationship with God. He seeks to dive deep into the heart of Job and walk to and fro within it and expose it for what he thinks it is, hollow. Here Satan not only questions Job's heart and faith and love for God, he also questions God's overprotective and overindulgent treatment of Job. This so-called Son of God uses the Word of God, the Deuteronomic phrase, you have blessed the work of his hands, to challenge God. Satan's solution to the problem of God's overprotection and overindulgence is simple. Stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. Smite your servant. Take away the land flowing with milk and honey. Bring on some of Egypt's plagues. Bestow boils. Eliminate the animals. Kill the firstborn. Then we will see Job's true heart. Of course, we know the story that Job was faithful to God, even though he suffered the loss of so much. This issue Satan raised with God is still the issue for all of us today. Will we be faithful to God when we are faced with losing everything, including our own lives? For the most part, the modern day church is lost to this issue because they are so busy attending prosperity gospel churches so they can have more success and money and live comfortable lives. The fifth problem with this pre-tribber argument about Christ beating up his bride, it rejects the issue that was raised with Job, the issue of integrity no matter what the cost, and also the wisdom of the cross. When we look back to that moment when Jesus begins explaining to his disciples that from this point forward he had to go to Jerusalem, that he's going to be betrayed, he's going to be crucified, he's going to be murdered, But on the third day, he's going to rise again. And Peter, who is his good friend, who again does not understand the wisdom of the cross at that time, he says, Not so, Lord, not so. So Peter rebuked Jesus. 
But then how did Jesus respond? He said, get behind me, Satan. Probably, arguably, the strongest rebuke in the entire New Testament was reserved for Peter. Jesus said, get behind me. You're speaking with the wisdom of the serpent. You're speaking with the logic of the serpent. He says, you have the things of man in mind. You don't have the things of God in mind. So when people say God would never allow his bride to go through the tribulation, otherwise he is a wife beater, this is the wisdom of the serpent, the logic of the snake. This is the wisdom of man. This is not the wisdom of the cross. People who say this are not understanding the issue of integrity placed before all Christians. It's not the wisdom of God. As Luke chapter 6, 22 through 23 says, Blessed are you when people hate you. Blessed are you when they exclude you, revile you, cast you out, say your name is evil. He says, For the Son of Man's sake, rejoice in that day and leap for joy when you get treated cruelly by others because of the name of Jesus. When your life is miserable, when you suffer, because you have chosen to say no to the things of the world when you've chosen to stand up for Jesus, when you have chosen to prove the devil a liar. He says, rejoice and leap for joy. So that's a very different mindset from what the pre-tribbers hold, isn't it? Obviously, no one likes the suffering, but when we have God's big heavenly perspective in mind, and when we understand the big picture, when we understand that the present sufferings are not even worthy to be compared to the weight of glory that we will inherit in the kingdom age. Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him. When we recognize that these things are temporary, they're just temporary passing afflictions, But the weight of glory that awaits us in the age to come, even as Jesus inherited and stepped into his inheritance, and this joy we also will inherit. So we have to walk away and reject the wisdom of this world that doesn't see the big picture and issue at stake here. Keep in mind John chapter 15 verses 18 through 20. Here the New American Standard Bible says, If the world hates you, You know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you as well. So we as Christians should celebrate, we should leap for joy at the thought for the opportunity to glorify God, not mock, reject, and scorn the idea that we as the body of Christ might suffer for his name. Here's a question we should ask, why do we celebrate the tribulation saints standing firm, bearing patiently until the end, enduring to the end? Why do we celebrate when they don't love their lives even unto death? We celebrate it if they do, but we mock it if that was to happen to us. It's inconsistent. It's a completely inconsistent attitude. We know from the Old Testament that ultimately Israel is the bride. Israel is the original bride. We Christians are grafted into this previous program God made with Israel. Yahweh repeatedly calls himself Israel's husband. There's not two weddings. It's not like pre-tribbers say. Well, Yahweh is the husband of Israel, but Jesus is the bridegroom of the church. You'll actually have some ministers that say Jesus made two new covenants, one with Israel and one with the church. Then you end up with this crazy dualism, different destinies, different plans of salvation, different covenants, different new covenants, and crazy ideas that are not taught in Scripture. No, there's one wedding the Bible speaks about. There's one bride. This is why Jesus said to the centurion, he said, Look, I haven't seen faith this great in all Israel. I'm telling you, many will come from the east and the west, the Gentiles, and they will recline at the table. That's the wedding feast, the marriage banquet with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Gentiles with the patriarchs of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all at the same feast, all at the same banquet. Isaiah chapter 25 says, On that day on this mountain, 
On Mount Zion, the Lord will put on a choice banquet, a feast for all peoples. It's in Zion, it's in Jerusalem, it's Israel, and it's for all peoples. Okay, so there's not two weddings, one for the church and one for Israel. That's just not found in the scriptures. In Revelation chapter 19, the New Jerusalem calls Israel the bride, but it never calls the church the bride. So we are grafted into this previously existing project, but the main point is Israel is the bride. And if Israel is the bride, then is the Lord guilty of letting them, the Jews, get beat up during Jacob's trouble during the Great Tribulation? Is Jesus guilty of being a spouse abuser because he's letting his bride, the Jews, get beat up just before he returns? Because if we use this cliche, because all the pre-tribbers will say, no, we're going to get raptured out of here, but the Lord's going to beat up Israel, but Israel's the bride, what happened to your cliche? It doesn't work. Again, Jesus and the Father will allow those they love to be chastised. He always has. He will allow his children to imitate their master. He will allow us to imitate Jesus. He will allow us to be faithful martyr witnesses to endure till the end. To love not our lives unto death, to bear witness to the world concerning the coming kingdom of God. God refers to Israel. He says, he who touches you touches the pupil of my eye. God loves Israel. He calls her beloved. There's this ongoing love relationship that God has with Israel because he knows in his sovereign plan that all of Israel who accept the Messiah when Jesus returns will be saved. So God loves Israel, God loves the faithful church, and he loves those who will be part of his body. He knows those that will be his. So you can't say he's going to save us from punishment, save us from tribulation, but he's going to let Israel go through it. That's really a perverse view. In other words, he's going to deliver us, but he's going to torture the apple of his eye. You see how that makes no sense. Then there's the issue of the problem of the tribulation saints, and I've already touched on this. The problem with the tribulation saints is you have literally a great multitude of saints alive on the earth during the great tribulation period, and God will give authority to the beasts to overcome them. The Bible's very clear about that. Scriptures are very clear that the Lord will give his body, church, over to the beast. Again, why does God allow this? I've also touched on this, that Jesus overcame the world by laying down his life, and he says, take courage, I have overcome the world. And so we are called to imitate him as well. We also will overcome this world by laying down our lives if need be, because He is the one that holds our life in his hands. We will lay down our lives, trusting ourselves to him. That is how Jesus overcame the serpent. That's how he ultimately sealed the fate of the snake. He laid down his life, and we are called to imitate him. We are called upon to do the same. In Revelation chapter 13, verses 5 through 8, describes how the beast will conquer God's people on earth during the Great Tribulation. There it says the beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months, which is three and a half years. This is referring, obviously, to the Great Tribulation period. Verse 6 says it opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. Notice verse 7, it says, It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them, and it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life the lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. So here the beast is permitted to wage war against the saints, that's us, and to conquer them. God will allow his saints to be conquered by the beast as he allowed his son Jesus Christ to be betrayed, to be arrested, to be mutilated and killed. He calls us to imitate his son. 
Revelation 13 verse 10 says, If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword they will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. So we have to internalize, we have to recognize, we have to grasp the wisdom of the cross and the issue that Satan put before all of God's people. Will we curse God when we have to face death? It's in the midst of suffering that we're called to endure, to be patient, and to remain loyal to God. Revelation 17 verse 6 says that Christians will be bearing witness to Jesus and the kingdom deep into the great tribulation. There it says, I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. So there's going to be a lot of blood of the saints shed in the great tribulation, but it does not make God unjust. It doesn't make him unjust in the least bit, because we know that Satan is behind the beast, and Satan is the one killing the saints, not God. We must remember the issue raised by Satan regarding Job. Will you stop serving God when your life is on the line? Finally, in closing, let me just say that this this type of emotionally manipulative statement that God would never allow his church to go through the tribulation that God's a wife beater or a spouse abuser. He's going to let her be beaten up with a dress all bloodied up and ripped and eyes hanging out. Don't ever say that about God. This type of logic is the wisdom of the serpent. It's truly sad today that there are so-called Christian ministers that are using this type of rhetoric, this type of argument, this type of cliché, this wisdom of the serpent. We need to recognize it as an ignorant argument. It is a completely disgusting argument that we need to reject. Okay, I'm going to end this video here, but stay tuned for part 12 of this video series where we will continue to show that pre-tribulationism is a false doctrine. And as always, thanks very much for watching. 